So thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Mary, and thank you for the invitation to talk today. And uh, I, I'm going to discuss neuropathic pain. There's going to be an emphasis on the role of iron channels in neuropathic pain. And I'll be somewhat continuing the theme of inherited changes because much of that will relate to uh, genetics and variants in those iron channels that may ultimately inform treatment. So we've seen a nice convergence between human genetics and our understanding as to how sensory neurons and particularly nociceptors which detect tissue injury work. And just to give you a very basic introduction, nociceptors provide connectivity between a target such as the skin and the central nervous system. They have free nerve endings within the epidermis shown within these arrows. And when I started in this field quite some time ago, we knew that there were injurious stimuli, whether mechanical, thermal, or, or chemical, uh, that could cause tissue injury, and that these would activate nociceptors. But we had no idea how this happened. And what's happened in the meantime is that we've now filled in that black box. So we realize that there are ligand-gated ion channels that respond to those specific energies, and that will result in an ionic flux in nociceptors that will produce a generator potential. That can be modulated by other factors such as G protein coupled receptors. But importantly, that generator potential is then amplified by a specific group of voltage gated sodium channels, which show selectivity for their expression within nociceptors. And I will be coming back to this point because it's relevant to human genetics in a moment. Just to say that there are also breaks on excitability. So potassium channels act as a break on excitability. And actually uh, the talk we'll hear next will relate to some autoantibody mediated pain disorders that may relate to potassium channels. And there are also pacemaker channels. The cell bodies of nociceptors are in dorsal root ganglion. And uh, I just want to show this slide to make the point that there are different flavors of nociceptors. They, their function is very much determined by the ion channels they express, and their phenotype can change. So that after nerve injury, for instance, we're talking about neuropathic pain, alterations in the expression and trafficking of ion channels can have an important impact on function and cause hyperexcitability and pain. They terminate in the superficial laminae of the spinal cord, and ion channels are there, are there and also very important for function, for instance, regulation of neurotransmitter release, and that's how some of the important drugs we use to treat neuropathic pain, such as gabapentinoids, work. So just to kind of give you some examples how uh, human genetics of extreme changes in, in pain sensitivity have informed our knowledge of the system. So this is a 26-year-old man that I look after in Oxford, and he was born unable to perceive pain. And whatever the stimulus, whether it's mechanical, thermal or chemical, he never experiences it as painful. And this, you know, really these kind of patients tell us evolutionarily why we are born with a nociceptive system, because he's fractured every long bone in his body as a consequence of not being able to feel pain. So multiple injuries to his mouth, and you can see the family pedigree. This is an autosomal recessive condition. And he sadly, uh, one of his younger sisters died just due to sepsis, which was unrecognized. Mary was talking about the importance of clinical phenotype uh, and actually there are some clues on examining him because he can't smell and I'll come back to that that's kind of pathognomic actually this condition uh, and then in terms of examining the sensory motor system motor function is normal and large fiber sensory functions such as touch proprioception vibration is all normal but he has a selective very severe deficit in that whatever the stimulus he doesn't perceive it as painful and this way he came to clinic just the week after trapping his finger in a door and not feeling it uh, and he had a nasty injury to his distal phalanx, which was completely painless. And the genetic basis of this was discovered by Jeff Woods, uh, looking at some consanguineous Pakistani kindreds. And he showed that one of those ion channels I was mentioning earlier that's highly expressed in those sectors, NAV 1.7, that by allelic mutations in this ion channel cause congenital insensitivity to pain. And in red uh, here, this is a schematic of this voltage gated sodium channel, NAV 1.7 seven and it, the red circles are for the two uh, variants that exist in this patient that I just discussed recently. NEV 1.7 is highly expressed not just in sensory neurons but also in olfactory neurons and that's why you get this combination of anosmia and pain insensitivity. We were under, interested in understanding more the mechanisms but behind this, I mean our hypothesis was that this related to reduced excitability within nociceptors. The first thing to say was uh, when you undertake electrophysiological analysis, 
Um, if you compare the wild type in black to mutations associated with congenital insensitivity to pain, basically what these variants are doing is they're stopping this channel from passing any current. So it's a loss of function at the channel level. What about at the neuronal level? Well, now we have the advantage that we can generate iPSCs from patients and then we can differentiate them into nociceptors in a dish. So in red is marking the cell bodies, and then in green are these beautiful long axonal tracts. And we undertook genomic engineering, we wanted to see if NAB 1.7 was expressed in these cultures, and indeed it was. So here we've been tagged the endogenous locus. So there's an a, a HA tag on this protein, and you can see that NAB 1.7, as we track through this video, is expressed on the surface of these neurons and also trafficked to the axons. And importantly, we can, when we when we myelinate these cultures, uh, we can see that it's highly expressed at the node of Ronvier in red here. And we can take functional analysis with patch clamp analysis. And the take home message is that our prediction was correct. And that in patients with loss of function mutations in NAV1.7, that have congenital insensitivity to pain, the nociceptors are less excitable. So you need to inject more current to elicit an action potential. And if you keep on injecting current, what will happen is you'll uh, produce multiple action potentials and you get this repetitive firing. And we've quantified that and you can see an even bigger difference as we keep injecting current, we're, we're accentuating this difference between the healthy control lines and these lines from patients with congenital insensitivity pain, which show a marked hypo excitability. So we really have the explanation at a physiological level as to why these nociceptors are not working. Of course, it's raised great interest for this as a target in pain research. Well, there is a mirror image to the story that I've just told you, and the theme will stay on this sodium channel NAV 1.7. And that's because some people are born with excess pain. So one example is erythromyalgia. Um, this again is one of my patients, and you can see that she has very red feet. And uh, warmth tends to make the redness and also elicit a very severe pain syndrome affecting her feet, her fingers, and sometimes her ears. And this is also associated with mutations in NAV 1.7, but these variants, they're not causing loss of function, they're causing gain of function. And we now know more than 20 mutations associated with inherited erythromyalgia. And basically what they're doing is they're making the channel more likely to open. There is not, uh, yet another condition which is called paroxysmal extreme pain disorder, uh, which at uh, this time there's severe pain and erythema affecting more proximal regions so around the perineum uh, as an example in this baby or around the mouth usually triggered by mechanical stimulation and again this is associated with mutations in NAV 1.7 but the biophysical basis is somewhat distinct uh, in that these mutations are preventing the channel from closing so they block inactivation and the channel remains open. And then finally, uh, Karen Faber and Steve Waxman in small fiber neuropathy, where there's a de degeneration of the terminals of nociceptive afferents, uh, in those patients where they couldn't find an underlying cause, idiopathic, uh, they found a number of variants in NAV 1.7. And I'm using that word advisedly. Erythromyalgia and paroxysmal extreme pain disorder are Mendelian disorders. If there is a mutation there, it's fully penetrant. In the context of small fiber neuropathy, my personal view uh, is that these are variants that are increasing risk of small fiber neuropathy. And that's because they are present uh, within the general population, albeit a, a relative uh, a kind of intermediate frequency, uh, but I see them as risk factors. And it, these are a different group of mutations, which again, are thought to cause gain of function. And essentially to summarize what, what these various variants are doing, uh, is that if here, this is work from Steve Waxman expressing wild type or mutant, that increasing the excitability of nociceptors leading to more action potential. So this is very much the mirror image of loss of function of NAV 1.7. We were part of a big study led by William Irwant uh, in, in Cambridge, where he was looking at rare disorders and the application of whole genome sequencing to normal clinical practice. Uh, and this was a consortium uh, around the UK. And we recruited patients with uh, neuropathic pain across a number of centers uh, that have fairly extreme phenotypes. And we were interested in, in kind of seeing how informative whole genome sequencing was. And actually, I think I very much echo many of the comments that Mary made in her talk. Uh, so one of the issues is we find lots of variants. Um, we had a panel of genes that we uh, were implicated in pain disorders or in painful neuropathy. 
And I think one take home message um, is that the most informative genes were the vulgated sodium channels in terms of these pain disorders. NAV 1.7, which we've discussed at length, but also NAV 1.8 and 1.9. Um, and the, the, these accounted for the majority of the cases where we thought that there were variants of clinical significance. Um, and certainly one of the challenges that we found in the project as a whole is that the genetics in terms of identifying variants is way ahead of our ability to undertake functional analysis in all of them. But I do think there's clearly relevance to rare pain disorders. What about a more common neuropathic pain disorder? So diabetic neuropathy uh, is common and it's getting more common as we have an obesity epidemic. And we did a very kind of simple comparison of saying, what well, did we find segregation of, of rare variants in sodium channels in painful versus painless diabetic neuropathy? And in fact, that, that proved to be the case. So we, we found a number of variants that were enriched in the painful neuropathy group. And again, I see these as risk factors. These are people that they don't have pain until they develop diabetic neuropathy. And interestingly, a number of these variants, in fact, the ones in blue, had previously been described in the context of small fibers. Same group. Some of them are completely novel, and some of these variants were really quite rare. And there, there were variants in amino acids in NAV 1.7 uh, that, that are highly conserved between different sodium channels and also evolutionarily conserved. So, again, some of the pointers Mary was using to try and gauge how significant we think a, a variant is. And then we could go on uh, and think about what the functional implications of those variants may be. One of the advantages that we now have is that uh, through really some excellent cryo-EM uh, work, we have built up three-dimensional structures of this vulgated sodium channel. And so for instance, this variant here, uh, which we find in NAV 1.7, um, we see that in a part of the channel that we know is likely to be important for an activation. So this kind of three-dimensional modeling uh, for ion channels is helpful to make us make predictions as to whether we likely think something may be uh, pathogenic and what its effects potentially could be. So we can make these predictions and then test them electrophysiologically. And that's what we have done with patch clamp analysis. Uh, so we can express either the control or uh, the variants that we found associated with painful diabetic uh, neuropathy. And to cut a long story short, we, we saw quite large effects of these, these variants on inactivation of this channel. Uh, so the channel is actually less likely to inactivate. That is going to lead to a bigger drive for excitability, a window current, and that's going to lead to hyperexcitability. So we've, again, we've got this strong link between the clinical phenotype and the impact of an ion channel variant in terms of excitability of nociceptors. So I, I, I've spent quite a lot of time talking about NAV 1.7, but you, I hope I've convinced you and you can see why uh, in terms of neuropathic pain, there's a lot of interest in, in this as a target for novel analgesics. And there's a lot of work to uh, on a number of different fronts, actually, uh, some of which is to develop, try and develop small molecules that selectively block NAV 1.7, but not other subtypes of vulgated sodium channels. That is difficult because there's a lot of homology in the key regions of sodium channels. Um, so that's a real challenge for chemistry. Um, there are also groups trying to develop antibodies that could be specific for NEV 1.7. And as you can imagine, there's also a lot of effort in terms of gene therapy of, of knockdown of NEV 1.7. But I, I would just like to make the point about what about the use of existing sodium channel blockers? So most of these are not selective. Um, they would impact on a number of different sodium channel subunits, but maybe particular variants could be uh, sensitive to particular sodium channel blockers. In terms of kind of thinking about specificity of treatment for neuropathic pain and sodium channel blockers. Well, kind of the traditional approach has been to take a non-selected patient cohort and trial a treatment. Um, and actually sodium channel blockers, uh, they have mild effects in this kind of unselected cohorts, but maybe not as much efficacy as we would expect. But could we segregate patients, so stratify them according to their genotype? And could we even adopt a kind of fully personalized approach? I'm just gonna uh, tackle a couple of those points. So there is some evidence for that now. So leucosamide um, is not tremendously successful in unselected patients with neuropathic pain. Uh, but Ingmar Merkies and Karen Faber said, well, uh, we have a cohort of patients with small fiber neuropathy and rare variants in NAV 1.7. NAV 1.7 is a sodium channel that's sensitive to leucosamide. So maybe we can try and target that group and see efficacy. And that's exactly what they did. So they recruited patients with small fiber neuropathy and rare variants in NEV 1.7. And in a randomized controlled trial, they showed significant efficacy of leucosamide in that group. Actually, what I like about that study is they went one stage further. So working with Steve Waxman 
again, they drew this nice correlation between iron channel function and clinically relevant pharmacology because they showed that those variants uh, in which people are clinically responded to glucosamide, they also those variants when expressed in vitro showed a pharmacological response to glucosamide. So as it were, closing the circle. What about kind of fully personalized medicine? I think there's going to be very few examples of this, but there, there are a couple. And really, I think those examples relate to high impact uh, mutations causing Mendelian pain disorders. So erythromyalgia, that condition with the painful red extremities I was talking to you about earlier, is very difficult to treat. Normally, it doesn't respond to carbamazepine. Uh, but again, Steve Waxman had a family uh, where they had this V400M mutation, which they found serendipitously did respond to carbamazepine. And using the three-dimensional modeling I was talking about earlier, they found that this was near another variant that could also be mutated and cause erythromyalgia. So they made a prediction. These were energetically linked, and the prediction was that this would also respond to carbamazepine. In vitro, uh, they showed that the excitability of neurons expressing this variant could be reduced by carbamazepine. And they are, actually went one step further. Uh, so they, they contacted the, the, the relevant family, they did a double blind, small, uh, but double blind randomized trial, and they showed that indeed clinically, this family with, with this S241T variant did respond to carbamazepine. So in a way that's fully personalized medicine. Another example was that we found um, a variant in NAV 1.8 causing neuropathic pain in a, in a, in a group. And uh, this variant, S242T, so this is a different sodium channel, but it's exactly the same uh, residue as it's homologous to the serin 241. And here we've done three-dimensional modeling. So now instead of jumping within a sodium channel, we've jumped from one sodium channel, NAV 1.7, to a different one, NAV 1.8. But we can show that this residue is exactly the same and it's oriented in the same direction. So again, we can now make a prediction that we felt that this was also likely to be responsive to carbamazepine, and that proved to be the case, both pharmacologically and clinically. Uh, so we have a, a few rare examples of, as it were, fully personalized pain medicine. Now, so far, I've been talking about uh, con uh, this in relation to iron channel variants, but could we engineer iron channels for our own uses? So example of this is chemogenetics. And this would be where you, you engineer an ion channel and express it in your neuron of interest. And so we did proof of concept of this using a chloride channel, a glucial channel, which we could express in nociceptors in the rodents. And it's engineered so that it only passes the current when you uh, give a ligand, uh, so you dose uh, the, the experimental animal in this case, uh, with a ligand that is inert, uh, and it, but it activates that channel specifically. And this was ivermectin. And when the channel's activated, it silences the neurons. Uh, and this, we found an experimental model very effective in treating neuropathic pain. The trouble is that particular channel that we've used uh, to control excitability, so as where we control excitability remotely, is, was derived from C. elegans. But this is a fast moving field. So Scott Sternson at Genedia Farm has now developed a fully humanized form of chemogenetics. Uh, so this is based on the nicotinic uh, receptors. Uh, and again, you can give a, a ligand which doesn't do anything to the normal nervous system, but when you've expressed uh, this channel, it activates the channel. And he's shown very effectively uh, it can act and silence neurons. And we have data where we've generated nociceptors from iPSCs and we've used the system. And we can, again, very effectively damp down their excitability uh, and silence them. So I think this is not something we're going to see in the clinic soon, uh, but I do think in a number of areas of neuroscience, people are thinking about, can we use this remote control of, of excitability in clinically relevant states? So I'm going to uh, kind of just conclude there. So I, I hope I've shown you that we are finding new ion channel variants. These were initially really found in, in the relation to very rare Mendelian pain disorders, but we are now seeing uh, their importance in some much more common acquired neuropathic pain disorders. But this is relevant to treatments, and you know we're trying to develop new treatments targeting specific sodium channels, but actually it's also some very novel ideas around chemogenetics. But actually, there are things we can do right now about better targeting of existing therapies, and I've tried to give you some examples with both stratified or personalized approaches. I'll just end by kind of thanking uh, my lab, my many collaborators, uh, and my funders, and I'm more than happy to take questions. 
Thank you very much, David. We're, we're a bit tight on time, so I don't think we have time for many questions, but if there is anyone that has a question, maybe I can have one. So that was fantastic, David. So in a pragmatic question here, in routine clinical practice for people who see painful neuropathies, do you think there's any role for people to be screening sodium 1.7 mutations in routine practice? Because none of them are pathogenic in the traditional sense, they're risk factors, and that may be misleading, yeah. or outside a research setting. Uh, so I, I think you could argue that for small fiber neuropathy, there is some argument for that now, because in unselected patients, the, the evidence is leucosamide is not very effective. But there is now that, that nice trial, which, which shows that, that in a stratified approach, leucosamide had a significant effect. So, so I, I think if, if you had small fiber neuropathy, it's idiopathic, um, particularly if it was kind of early onset, if there's any kind of familial history, then I, then I think I would have a low... I would have a low threshold, but that's a, and and obviously the very rare Mendelian disorders I've spoken about. I think, to be honest, we're not there yet for kind of much more common neuropathies like painful diabetic neuropathy, and we don't have the direct evidence. So I think I would only do it where I think it's going to inform my clinical practice. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for that great talk about new insights into neuropathic pain.